Welcome, welcome everybody. We'll give it a few more minutes. Get started on time here. Welcome, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight on DEP's Coral Reef Conservation Program's Earth Month webinar series. I'm going to introduce your speaker. My name is Melissa Sate, and I am president of DEP's Coral Program's citizen support organization called Friends of Our Florida Reefs. And I have the pleasure of presenting your instructor tonight, Anna Zangronis who uh, I'm lucky enough to call friend and former colleague. Uh, we used to work together. She works with the Florida Sea Grant Extension now. And um, you're gonna, about to have a fabulous presentation by her. She's a fish expert. And I'm gonna be here behind the scenes to help her answer questions and any technical problems you all may have. So take it away, Anna. Thanks a million, Melissa. And thanks for having me, everybody. Welcome. And that was a that was a really humbling introduction. But make no mistake, Melissa Sate, if I'm a fix fish expert, she is the fish expert to the power of 10. She even knows all of the scientific names. So, you know, definitely pepper in questions into the chat because she'll be able to assist as well. Probably better than I could if I'm gonna tell you the truth. So for those of us who for those of you guys who are joining us for the first time tonight. 
Welcome. We're going to briefly go over some basic tricks and tips for learning Fish ID. And for those of you who were with us last week, we are going to continue on with the second half of fish groups that we started. So this presentation is being recorded. Everyone who has registered will receive a link to the recording so you'll be able to reference the presentation. And I've also put my email into the chat box or is it chat or the questions box? You should be able to see it. And yeah, let's go ahead and get into this. All right, let's get the clickies to go. All right, oh, just wanna make mention to follow my program on social media if you are so inclined at Miami Dade Sea Grant. I only post cool things and once in a while, so I won't inundate your feeds, I promise. And I do wanna mention, I saw my friends Terry and Chuck online, so nice to see you guys. They've been hanging out with me every month for the last year in webinars that I do here uh, second Wednesdays of the month, and I'll talk about that at the very end. But hey, Terry and Chuck, and they're also members of the nonprofit Diving with a Purpose. So what you're seeing on the screen is a great tool. This is the Human and Deloach Reef series. There's Reef Fish, which is clearly our focus tonight, as well as Reef Coral and Reef Creature. And I just definitely suggest if you're interested in learning more about what we have underwater, to invest in one, if not all of these books, because they are a great reference and have tons of information and really will help make your experience that much better. We are gonna talk about a handful of fish groups that are found within Florida's coral reef. And I also wanna take this opportunity to bring your attention to this turquoise box here on the screen. This is the northernmost 100 miles of the Florida Coral Reef that is managed by DEP's Coral Reef Conservation Program. And it recently earned a, an official title, the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Ecosystem Conservation Area. So there's all these different boxes indicate different management by different agencies. But now we've got one in the northern section of the reef tract, which extends all the way up to the St. Lucie Inlet in Martin County. So anywhere along the reef tract is fair game to see the fish that we're gonna be talking about today. All right, so for those of you who were here last week, just bear with me while we review these next couple of slides. It's really helpful when we start learning some techniques in terms of fish identification to make sure that we're all using the same verbiage. So the top of the fish is referred to the dorsal side versus the underside of the fish is the ventral. Front of the fish is the anterior and the rear or back of the fish is the posterior. And you see that bony fish, which is the majority of where we're gonna be looking at tonight, have multiple sets of fins, including their dorsal fin, their caudal or their tail fin, their anal fin under the body, pelvic fins, and pectoral fins. These next few slides come straight from the Reef Environmental Education Foundation in Key Largo. And I also wanna mention that this entire presentation is based on the way that they group fish for identification for use in their surveys. So all of these graphics and the majority of the pictures that you're looking at come from Reef and they do a really fantastic job of making it a little bit more attainable how to learn fish ID. So we're gonna be talking about some terminology that is present uh, depending on the fish species. And the first are vertical stripes, which are also known as bars. And some of the species we discussed last week actually has the name bar in its, uh, in its common name. We also have stripes or horizontal lines. Bands, which are diagonal stripes. Spots, which is essentially a big dot. An oscillated spot is simply a spot that has a ring or a line around it. 
Blotches are simply a bunch of a grouping of speckles or markings very closely put together. And then lastly, we have lines radiating from the eye, which some of you might guess, this is actually a way for fish to help deter from predation. And I wanna give the disclaimer now that everything we're looking at tonight, we're looking at the adult or terminal phases of the fish. And we're doing that just to make it a little bit more, a little bit easier, frankly, because a lot of these fish have different markings or patterns or coloration depending on what phase of their life that they're in. So we are focusing specifically on the adult or terminal phase. Last week, we covered groups, fish ID groups one through five. And today we're gonna to be going through six through 12. And you'll see by the names here that these are grouped by either physical characteristics and or physical behaviors that they exhibit. So that's how these fish groups go together. And so we're gonna be looking at a handful of representative species within each group or family. The first that we're gonna be looking are, at are the fish that swim with their pectoral fins or have obvious scales. And we're gonna be looking at two families within this fish ID group, the parrotfish as well as the wrasse. And these both have large noticeable scales. Within these families, the fish in them can change sex within their lifetime and can exhibit two or more color patterns in the same species. The parrotfish get that common name because their teeth have fused into powerful beaks which they then utilize to scrape and remove algae from coral. And fun fact, if you didn't know, that the sand that you see when you were either out snorkeling or diving in the ocean comes from parrotfish poop. Yes, that's right, parrotfish poop. And they can produce up to about a ton of sand per year. The first species that we're gonna look at is the rainbow parrotfish. It's a really gorgeous fish. It's the largest in the tropical Western Atlantic and Caribbean and can grow, I mean, I haven't seen them four feet in length, but I've definitely seen them two feet in length. And they're distinguished not only because the multiple colors that they show, but they have orange edged fins, both their, their excuse me, their anal, their tail fin and their pelvic fins. And as I mentioned, they are herbivores, they graze algae. So we love a healthy and booming parrotfish population. Next up is the blue parrotfish, which has this pretty easy to identify squarish hump head. I actually called this the hump head parrotfish today. I saw a bunch, this is not the right word. It's the blue parrotfish. And when they get to this adult, more terminal phase, they are this iridescent blue. They might even have more, almost like a lavender or lilac type of shade as seen as in the photo in the upper right. But you can't mistake it. And as well as that opening of the mouth and the beak is pretty small when you compare it to the beak on the rainbow. So here we've got more, almost like a toucan sand type of mouth versus the blue parrotfish. It's got this little bitty mouth, but a very square head. Now this is almost like, I like to think of it as like a, a hybrid. It's not really, but just in terms of the way it looks physically, the body shape and style is extremely similar to that of the rainbow parrotfish. However, the coloration of the midnight parrotfish is this beautiful royal shiny blue with black undertones. The face will often have these lighter markings, more splotchy, but the dark blue and black are extremely easy to distinguish. But if you guys see, the head is more tapered like the rainbow parrotfish and not nearly as squared off and humpy, if you will, as the <laughs> blue parrotfish. And these will swim, sometimes you'll see them 
alone, but they can also swim in huge flocks, which is pretty fantastic. Now the stoplight parrotfish, I'm about to show you an example of the different phases that are exhibited in by a singular species. And so again, I want you guys to direct your main focus to the adult or terminal phase. And it gets, the stoplight parrotfish gets its common name from the three color tones that are found on its tail. The other really most important marking is the yellow spot right by their gills. So remember this yellow spot and the stoplight, the three toned of the tail. And this is where Melissa is truly phenomenal at her fish ID because when you have a fish that you see here in the upper right picture, when these guys are two inches long and there's a million of them swimming around and a million other babies, that can be, we have to identify all of them, not just the adults. But I just wanted you guys to get an idea of what this looks like. Oops, sorry. So this is a picture, a different view of the stoplight parrotfish, and you really can see how well-defined the scales are on this particular species. You can really see the different colors on the tail, and then there's that gill spot. Fun fact about parrotfish in general, that when they go to sleep at night and they, they nestle into the reef, into little nooks and crannies, they actually secrete this little mucus bubble around them. And so if you're ever doing a night dive and you see a parrotfish, you wanna be really careful not to disturb it because you don't wanna disturb that mucus bubble. Now I'm about to bring out one of Reef's quintessential memory clues for this fish. This is the red band parrotfish. This is really common. It's not as large as the stoplight parrotfish, which can grow to one to two feet. These usually stay smaller than a foot, but what you're looking for is the red stripe that connects, it goes from the mouth and almost connects to the eye. You got this red ring around the eye that's pretty easy to look at as well. And the memory clue that I mentioned is Imagine Ray-Bans on the red band. So Ray-Ban sunglasses on this particular species of parrotfish. Now we're gonna transition from the parrotfish into the wrasse family. And the bluehead wrasse is a really common member of the reef community. They move, buzz, if you will, endlessly above the bottom. And they have these very small cigar shaped bodies. And what is distinguished by them, what distinguishes them is that as they mature, they have this blue head that separates their body by this black and white bars, bar pattern. I was gonna say banding, but technically they're bars. So the end of their tail also points. They have the very streamlined, pretty tail. And these guys are moving. There's usually a whole flock of them. They are not by any means solitary. Now, the yellowhead wrasse is pretty similar in body design and shape, but they tend to be larger in size and they get their common name because they exhibit this yellow fore part of the body. The anterior part of the body is yellow. And again, the yellow head and forebody are separated from the body by this black bar and black line that go down the length to its tail. So these you typically don't see in groups very, very frequently. You, you see them mostly as individuals. And these hunt more along the bottom for crustaceans. This is the Creole wrasse, and I love these because this purple color is really beautiful to look at, and there's also usually yellow edges on some of their fins. But you can see that they've got this little, almost like a trumpet opening of a mouth, and so they will pick plankton from the water column, as well as jellyfish and other invertebrates, and they're usually not impressed by divers. They're not gonna leave if they see you. and they're pretty easy to distinguish by this dark bluish purple color. And these fish have also been seen visiting cleaning stations where fish and shrimp 
pick parasites off of them, as you can see by this little goby right here. Now, I want to talk about the hogfish for a second because, you know, colloquially, this fish is referred to as a hog snapper, but the reality is it is truly a member of the wrasse family. And these are really prized in recreational and commercial fishing. They can grow pretty large, up to three feet long, and I think their fishing size is is it 16 inches total length? I don't know if it's total or fork, but it's a pretty big hogfish. So you definitely want to make sure you check the fishing regulations if you're fishing and you catch one before you keep it. So these fish are given that name because their snout, their mouth looks, or someone thought it looked like a fish. They can change color. They often have a spot on towards the back of their body around the second dorsal fin and then they have this like broom-like type of tail. And usually the first three spines of, oops, excuse me, sorry. The first three spines of their dorsal fins can are much longer and will stand up straight like that. So they're pretty unmistakable. And when they're little, oh, they're adorable. This is a little one here in the upper right photo. So I'm gonna put some of these pictures up and I'm gonna ask you guys to type into the questions box what you think these fish are. And I'm gonna try and go a little bit more slowly this time so that way give you guys the opportunity to guess. All right, I think I saw a rainbow parrot, yep. All right, Pamela, VL, Donna, LGBTQ parrot. That's a fantastic answer, Chuck. <laughs> All right, next up. All right, what photo do we have on the screen here? LBG, LGBTQ parrot, I love it. All right, blue head wrasse, blue, yep, very good, nice guys. See my friend Stephanie's on. Hey, Stephanie. Okay, what do we have here? We know it is not the blank snapper. Oh, Jason Taylor, is that number 99 of the dolphins? Don't play with my emotions, Jason. Ah, oh, so close. Great name, great name, Jason. Okay, next fish. All right, Creole wrasse, very good. What about here on the lower left of your screen? Yellow head, I see Janet Ramos, hi Janet. Okay, what about now? Blue parrot, yep, nice job guys. Okay, last, oh, second to last one. Yep, stoplight parrot. I sometimes say spotlight, but you know, as long as you know what it is. Good job, y'all. All right, what do we have here? Ooh, I'm seeing a couple interesting name variations. Red stripe parrot, red line parrot. Ray band, yep. This is a red band parrotfish. Put the ray bands on the red band. All right, last parrotfish. Nicely done. Midnight parrot, midnight or 6:20 p.m. parrotfish. Good job, you guys. I think that was the group that had the most fish, so I think the others are going to move a little bit more quickly. So we're moving into fish group seven, which are reddish fish. There are only two species in this group. And if you take note, these fish have very dark eyes and that's because they feed and hunt at night. So it helps them, this is their one of their adaptations to help them get their prey. And they also have this red coloration to help them 
blend into the reef. And we're gonna be looking at two members of the squirrelfish family. The first is a good old squirrelfish and its body is red with gold and white reflections. And they're not too big. I tend to see them usually nine to 10 inches is pretty average. The reason they get their common name is because of this very tall pronounced Real do rear dorsal fin, the second dorsal fin, which, you know, again, to someone look like a squirrel's tail because of all the squirrels that swim around on the reef. And on these, the four dorsal fins, they have a more yellowish or gold tint to them. And you'll often see these fish under ledges, in crevices. Again, as you think about it, most of the time that we dive is during the day. So they're trying to hide around where it's dark until they can come out and wear their sunglasses at night. Now the long spine squirrelfish is very similar size and shape to the squirrelfish, but the white tips of their dorsal fins are what make the spines look longer, hence the common name long spine. And I'm doing air quotes with my hand that you can't see. Again, very similar body coloration to the squirrelfish, but what you're really looking for are these white tipped fins. This is a species that I will admit can be a little bit more challenging to identify in the water in real time, but you really, you just got to keep looking at a lot of them and practicing. So to review within this fish group, seven reddish fish. What do we have on the screen? Happy hour parrot. I don't know why this chat doesn't show up in order. Okay, there we go, Donna. Long spine squirrelfish, you bet. Nice job, guys and gals. All right, next photo. So we had the long spine squirrelfish, and now, yeah, just a squirrelfish. I will admit you can use process of elimination to guess on here because they some of them are the same photos. That's okay. We're gonna move into the next group, which are small elongated bottom dwellers. And I was just saying before we started, I was saying to Melissa and Christy that this is my goal this summer is to really try and up my game when it comes to these guys, because they're really small and they can be very cryptic. So I'm really, it's my goal to get better with these with this particular group for sure. So we're gonna be looking at gobies, blennies, and jawfish. Blennies usually have a curved, a curved stance, if you will, to their body posture. And gobies have two dorsal fins. Gobies are pretty unremarkable. They don't really do a whole lot. They, they stay flat most of the time and they keep their bodies straight. But the blennies are super cute because they use their little pectoral and pelvic fins to hold themselves up and they look almost like little cartoon characters. And you'll see these guys in little crevices with just their heads poking out, which are pretty, they're pretty adorable. Now the neon goby is one of the most common that you will see because oftentimes they will sit and rest on coral heads, just like you see these pairs here. And if you're unable to tell by the previous photo, most of these fish are two to three inches in length at the most. So hence the group name small elongated bottom dwellers. These guys are tiny. You'll also see the neon goby in cleaning stations on along different on different species of fish, including green moray eels. They're pretty nifty. Here is the gold spot goby, which is main characteristic is it's this brown bar that goes through its eye and its body is pretty remar unremarkable in terms of these beige and brownish spots blend right into the reef. 
So your main distinguishing features that you're looking for are these sets of brown squares that run the length almost on the ventral side of the body. And these fish live in small, small groups in sandy or rubble areas near the reefs. Now here's this blenny that I was telling you about. And these guys, they're just, they're so freaking cute. They look like little aliens or little cartoon characters. And this is the red lip blenny. This is one of the more common members of the reef community. More often than not, you'll see them with this dark or reddish body. But on occasion, they will show this white variation as well. But their main distinguishing feature are those red. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline lips okay and so like i said they'll perch up on their little fins and look at you and often stick their head out as and they use a coral head or other hard structure for cover last fish in this group is the yellowhead jawfish and if you've ever been to or are familiar with the blue heron bridge up in riviera beach in northern palm beach county you will definitely see these there. And I, some of you might have heard me refer that last week I said one of the fish looked like my dog. This reminds me of my dog too, just because he's got these really big eyes. But that aside, you've got this red head as well as other, excuse me, red, yellow head, as well as other parts and there's other patches throughout the body that have yellow coloration as well. And so they build these little burrows in sand and rubbly areas, and they will they will hang out head up, almost vertically looking at you. And these fish are really famous in the underwater photography world because the male jawfish will receive the eggs from the female jawfish and keep them in his mouth until they hatch. So there are tons of phenomenal macro photographs of male yellow-headed jawfish with their mouth open and you can see all the little eggs and little baby fish in there. That's really super cool. And if you haven't seen it, just Google it because it'll come up instantly, I, I assure you. So now let's review the fish that we talked about in this group. We had gobies, blennies, and jawfish. So what do we have on the screen right now? And if you say maybe she's born with it, maybe it's Maybelline. Ah, Maybelline, yes. This is a red lip blenny. <laughs> Nicely done. So remember your main distinguishing feature are these red lips. Something I forgot to mention is that blennies often also have these little antennae sticking off their head. So that's something good to look for also. Where's my mouse? Okay. We got a new one on the screen. We just saw the red lip Blenny. Yep. Michelle, Jason, Donna, Christopher, Gold Spot, Gobi. Nicely done. And I'll tell you guys, if you ever start doing fish surveys for reef for their fish counts, their citizen science work, the level four and level five fish surveyors, they know all of these. So that's, that's pretty gangster to get to that level. All right, what do we have here? Yes, a neon goby. Nicely done. I like this one, it's the side view. I don't even wanna give any of the characteristics away. Yep, yellowhead jawfish or yellowheaded jawfish. My dog, yes. <laughs> I should be careful of my own memory clues. I don't want any of you guys doing surveys and then reefs looking at your data sheet going, what? Okay, next group, odd-shaped bottom dwellers. Now, we're gonna be looking at a scorpion fish and a flounder. And something I wanna point out about 
the fish in this group is that these are ambush predators and they don't have the traditional fish shape. So you guys will see by these pictures how these adaptations have really helped and evolved to assist the fish. So the first is the peacock flounder, which I put in this circle here because I used to use this slide and then even I couldn't find the fish. So if you look a little bit closely, here's the body, there are the eyes, and then there's the tail right next to this little bit of Porites asteroides coral. And these fish can camouflage themselves. And something interesting that I wanna mention is that this is, it's not lying on its stomach, it's actually lying on its side. And it gets its common name because when it changes color and you can really see their blue ring spots, it's reminiscent of a peacock's feathers. And so these are often found in more shallow areas, rubbly or rock or bare hard bottom. And its mouth is on its, that underside, but it's really just its side of its body and it feeds. It's not an herbivore, it is a carnivore. Monkey bread. <laughs> okay, here's an example of the peacock flounder displaying its full, really iridescent coloration. And it's quite similar to that of a scrawled file fish, which we're gonna look at in just a couple of minutes. So you can see just how well these fish can change their coloration, very similar to the way octopus do, to blend in with their environment. All right, now we're gonna look at the spotted scorpion fish, which is native. It is a native fish. This is another fish that blends in well with its environment. And usually I won't even see them unless I accidentally scare it because when you do that and it swims away, it opens its pectoral fins in which it displays the spots that are visible here. But these will lay motionless on the bottom, they'll lay motionless on old coral heads or any, any type of hard structure. And these are what's known as a, a lie in wait predator. So in other words, it'll wait, 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 wait. And then right when you know its prey is unsuspe unsuspecting, it will capture it. It does have venomous spines in its four dorsal fins, for not F-O-U-R, but the front dorsal fins. And if anyone is familiar with the Indo-Pacific lionfish, they are actually members of the scorpion fish family. However, this fish is native to the tropical Western Atlantic. All right, so let's talk through, what did we just look at? Photo that's on the screen. Ah, the spotted scorpion fish looks like a stonefish. Yeah, sometimes that's like a colloquially used name, Layla. Yep, spotted scorpion fish, nicely done. All right, and then what about this one? Yep, peacock flounder, nicely done, Jason. Michelle, Pamela, Noelia, Terry, Donna, great. All right, group 10, odd-shaped swimmers. Within this group, we're looking at triggerfish, filefish, boxfishes, goatfish, trumpetfish, and puffers. And all of these are very uniquely shaped and spend the majority of their time swimming or in motion. Triggerfishes and filefishes are very closely related. They're given the nickname of leather jackets, which is describing their rough skin texture. Triggerfish and filefish also have a single spine on the very top of their body, which they can lock into place and use for self-defense. So the first fish we're gonna look at is a fish that falls into one of two families of pufferfish. 
And I'll mention that those are ones with no spines or smooth puffers like the sharp nose puffer, which is a little, little, little guy that looks like it's giving you a kiss. And then the spiny puffers. So, and that's what we're looking at here. The balloon fish is a spiny puffer. And these little guys are pretty shy. I would say at their largest, they get to be about eight inches. And their coloration is extremely distinctive. They've got this lightish brown interspersed with darker brown colors on their body. And then this bluish green eye with yellow flecks. Now, I also wanna mention that if you guys were ever in the water, it, it, it has used to be a thing for some dive guides to make these guys blow up or inflate. And that is a practice that I would just say is not recommended because these fish have that ability for their own self-defense and they can only do it a certain number of times in their life. So it's not a practice that you want to encourage of trying to force one of these puffer fish to inflate themselves. This is the fish I mentioned a couple of minutes ago when we were looking at the peacock flounder, just in terms of the gorgeous bluish purple iridescent stripes and spots on the scrawled file fish. These have very long and slender snouts and very small mouths. And the body is pretty flat if you were to look at it head on. And it has this broom-like tail. These will often float vertically and pick at or feed around soft corals, also known as gorgonians, and they can change the intensity of those blue iridescent, iridescent flecks. They're, really, they're pretty phenomenal, and they, they're also pretty friendly and will come up to you and check you out. So remember that the scrawled file fish, and you can't see it too well here, but here's that spine I mentioned that they can pull up and lock into place for their own defense. The queen triggerfish is, I would say, the most attractive triggerfish that we have here in the tropical western Atlantic. And that's because it's just has the nicest coloration pattern. The other triggerfish we have here are pretty unremarkable. They're, they're gray. They're not all that exciting to look at. But the main distinguishing feature here is that the queen has two blue lines, or you could argue whether they're bands or bars, that curve away from that tiny mouth on their face. They also have lines radiating from their eye. And in this bigger picture, you can see the blue that lines all of their fins. So again, the trigger fish and the file fish are in that quote, leather jacket family because they have that really tough texture. And you can see this small mouth, they use that mouth to feed on sea urchins and other invertebrates as they see fit. The trigger fish, the queen and the other species here are also not very shy about getting close to people, especially if they think the people are hanging out in their hood. Nothing bad, nothing, you know, harmful but they are not afraid of us, even though we are bigger than they are. Now the smooth trunk fish is in the box fish family and its skeleton is a little bit unusual in that its skeleton are these fused plates, fused hexagonal plates. And there, if you can ever get the chance to see an example of them, of the skeletons that is at an aquarium or Crandon Nature Center, I believe, has them. They're pretty neat looking, and they're different from a traditional fish skeleton. And this name, the smooth trunk fish, is indicative because they don't have any spines on their body, unlike a similar species, the cowfish, which does have spines. It has these little horns right above its head. So these black and white polka dot pattern, they can change that. They can lighten it or darken it. And their main thing that they use to hunt with is this little bitty mouth that they use to shoot water to help them find their food. And so they're super cute. They got this little tail. 
I feel like they're uh, they could be in Finding Nemo too, like friends of Dory's. And when they're juvenile, these little guys in the lower right, this is like the size of a thimble. It's I mean, it's as adorable. Anything baby is cute, but especially these little guys with the polka dots, I can't even stand it. Now, the yellow goatfish is almost, if for those of you who were here last week, this is almost the goatfish version of a yellow snapper. So if you were to take your hand right now and use it to cover up the head of the yellow goatfish, what you would see is what's the remaining two thirds of the body is very similar in design and coloration to the yellow tail snapper. These fish can get up to 12 feet long and the goatfish have a pair of barbels or their little, their little whiskers, their mustache, if you will, their sensory organs under their chin. Their other main characteristic are their widely spaced dorsal fins, okay? So you're, anytime you see these, well, I was about to say dorsal fins, these barbels or their whiskers, their little goatee, and the stripe that connects the eye all the way to the tail, you're knowing, you know that it's a yellow goatfish and not a yellow tail snapper. I'm sorry, did I say that goatfish get up to 12 feet long? No, thank you for catching that. No, 12 inches long, sorry, that would be a pretty scary fish. Thank you for that, everybody. <laughs> Oops, all right, trumpet fish. I love the trumpet fish because they, they're so weird looking. They are these long, skinny, flat fish. They will often swim head down and disguise themselves in sea rods like what we have here. And there are different color variations. There's the yellow, there's also the brown, and I've also seen blue, purple variations as well. And this mouth, I mean, it's a little hard to tell here, but when this mouth opens up, it goes from this to the size of a fish hula hoop equivalent. It's really quite startling if you ever witness it. So you see this little mouth and it literally expands three to four inches in radius. It's pretty, pretty interesting. And it gets its common name from this flared head and mouth, similar to that, or someone thought as a trumpet. And if you're ever underwater with me, my signal for trumpet, and you can't see me right now, but in front of my face, I'm imagining that I'm holding that brass instrument and I'm pumping my fingers on the buttons. I don't know what the real word, the keys is, but the most important part of this is that you have to hum. So as you're doing your fingers, you go do 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 do, and that's the trumpet fish. That's my trumpet fish call or signal. Pro tip, guys, pro tip. All right, let's go through this group. So show me what you've got. I'll give you a clue. This is in the leather jacket family. All right, Terry got it first, scrawled filefish, very nice. Good job, everybody. Okay, I'm gonna imagine that everyone is in their homes doing that new fish symbol or call that I just just described to you. Do 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 do, trumpet fish making the noise. Yes, you'll never forget it now. Oh, bonus. Terry, trumpet fish with rock beauty in the background, correct. All right. Little guy who uses those lips to stream water and uncover its prey. Cute platelet fish. <laughs> yes. Yep, that fused almost body armor for its skeleton. This is a smooth trunk fish. Smooth trunk fish. All right, this is a member of the puffer family and it is a puffer fish with spines. All 
All right, it's a balloon fish. Okay, this fish is the most attractive of the species that we have here in Florida. She's got her hair done, makeup right. Queen triggerfish, yeah. All right, last one in this group. This is the blank equivalent of a yellowtail snapper. Yep, yellow goatfish. Nicely done, everybody. A 12 foot, yes, a 12 foot yellow goatfish. I love, I love that you guys have a, excuse me, a sense of humor. I love it. All right, we're coming in on the home stretch, everybody. It's gonna get, it's gonna get real now. We're gonna look at just two eels, and these do look like snakes, but there are no sea snakes in this part of the world. We're gonna be looking at two species within the moray family. Now, the green moray is probably the most well known. It gets its name because it looks green. And that's because the body itself is not actually green, but blue in color. However, it's covered by this layer of yellow mucus. And these fish hide out. They're usually either within the reef or again, crevices, holes in structure. They're not particularly interested in interactions. Usually you'll just see their head sticking out and they look a little scurry because they have their mouths open and they're usually exposing their teeth. And that's not actually that they're trying to be aggressive, but instead they're breathing by opening their mouths so they can force more water through their gills. So all of that to say though, I don't suggest trying to pet green moray eels because eel bites are no joke. And I have two friends who have been bitten by eels and that was unprovoked. So, you know, let's leave nature alone to do their thing. And if you are lucky enough to see them free swimming though, they are really beautiful. It's quite a sight to watch them slither through the water. So smooth body, green, big pronounced teeth. And usually when they have their mouths open, you can catch some of those neon gobies in there doing a little cleaning action for them. The second, the second moray that we're gonna talk about is the spotted moray. And these are typically much smaller and much thinner in girth. They're not nearly as girthy as the green moray eel. And they're made distinguishable so I, I forgot to say it, you couldn't see it so much on the other pictures, but eels have one long continuous dorsal fin that runs almost the entire length of their body. And this side profile, the spotted moray, makes it a lot easier to see. But the spotted moray has these white and brown splotches that are often, you know, the polka dots are, it's hard to distinguish them, they're often connected. But this one is pretty easy to ID, and these are extremely common on the reef as well. All right, let's go over our eels. Spot, sea spot run, spotted moray, great. Green moray, awesome. I'll tell you what, I don't know too much about the lifespan of eels, but they're a pair of green mores that live in the National Aquarium in Baltimore, where I used to be a volunteer. Their names are Felix and Oscar. And when I started there in 2010, they were there and they are still there. So they have been living on exhibit for at least 10 years. So that's pretty cool to know. That's the only one I have as a reference because I I just have no idea how old eels can live to be. All right, you guys, this is it. This is the last group, the sharks and rays. Now, these fish are different from bony fish because 
they're members of the elasmobranch family. And essentially what that means is that their skeletons are made of cartilage rather than bone. So we're gonna be looking at the families of nurse sharks and rays. First is the Southern stingray, which is a ray that is found mostly either right on the bottom or flying or swimming just above the bottom. And that's because its mouth is located on the ventral side of its body. So this particular species buries itself in the sand, uses its spiracles to help push water to move the sand or the sediment out of the way to find their food. So sometimes they can submerge just like this. And all you might see are these eyeballs sticking up. They are not aggressive. Usually the contact stories that people have to share about stingrays are because they were on the beach and accidentally bumped into or stepped on a stingray. They do have a venomous spine on the underside of their tail that is simply for their own self-defense. They, again, they are not a threatening organism. The southern stingray is brownish or grayish in color. And from wingtip to wingtip, this particular species can grow up to five feet long. The spotted eagle ray is one of my favorite fishes ever. And if anyone wants to buy me a present on Etsy, there is a sculpture of three spotted eagle rays. So I have a big birthday coming up, so I'm just putting that out there. I'm completely just kidding, but seriously, Google spotted eagle ray art. They are, I just love them. And if you'll notice, there's a couple of things that are different versus the Southern stingray. The first I'm gonna point out is they're very triangular shaped pointed dorsal fins. The second is it's more duck-billed mouth. This is a species that flies or swims more actively higher up in the water column. It doesn't typically spend its time in the sand, in the sediment, the way the southern stingray does. It doesn't, I should say, it doesn't bury itself there. It actually uses this duck bill to poke through and try to dig out certain prey items like mollusks. These guys are also very famous because they put on spectacular shows. They can jump or breach the surface pretty high and have accidentally ended up on boats because they've done this. And sometimes I've heard it's because of they're trying to escape predation, but also sometimes because they're trying to shake off little parasites that are itching them or something. Our last species of the night is the nurse shark. This is sometimes given a colloquial name of a carpet shark because it hangs out on the bottom a lot. It also has its little barbells or whiskers, their sensory organs. It has this more square head and, oh, I'm sorry, these pictures are overlapping. Oh, I'll, I'll come back to this, but these are fish that do not have to continuously swim so that they breathe well. They can actually stay still for quite some time. While they don't have the same type of jaw structure and teeth as what we think of in a traditional quote shark, they actually do have a pretty ferocious bite. So it's not something, while they might not necessarily pay attention or seem unbothered by divers, I wouldn't suggest going after trying to have an interaction with them. Okay, here we go. Here's an example of this species. Under a ledge, under a crevice. What fish do we have here? Nurse shark, all right. That one's a little bit, I think it's, I think a lot of people know the nurse shark. We could probably do a whole class just on sharks. All right, the image on the right. Southern stingray, awesome. And last but not least in this review, a spotted eagle ray, great job. Spotted eagle ray, cool. All right, you guys, I have a slightly different ending 
than we had last week. So I'm gonna play a video of a dive and I'm gonna pause it at certain parts. And I want you guys to tell me fish that you see. And I'm specifically looking, if you can still see my mouth, mouse, at the two fish just about center of the screen, right along the mast that we have here underwater. So a lot of these are species that were covered last week. So if you were not here last week, don't worry, I'm gonna show you other stuff, other species as well. Yes, Sergeant Majors, nice. What about here in the lower left, as well as this little group right here? So here in the lower left, yep, we have a pork fish and then these deeply forked tails, brown chromies, you got it. And we got a whole bunch of, where's my mouse? Oh, sorry, what happened? Okay, sorry about that, y'all. I lost my pointer. This is in Key Largo, Pamela. This is a historical shipwreck. Ooh, ooh, pause, oh. It's all going downhill. Okay, what about right here? I don't even wanna pause it. This is a juvenile, but it looks the same in its juvenile form. Yep, this is a queen angelfish and this this wreck is in about 15 or 18 feet of water, and I was shooting with a Sea Life DC something. This is just available light and one of their preset white balances. I'm just gonna let it run. Okay, what just swam out of the frame? Humans, yes. There was a gray angelfish that just swam. Sorry, guys, I'm afraid to touch anything else because it keeps messing stuff up. In the center, we have, this is a, it's in the grouper family. It was a Labrador of the sea, it was a red grouper. Yep, there were some margate, there were also white grunts. There was a mangrove snapper, the little yellow guy that was at the bottom of the screen, that was a juvenile blue tang. Lionfish, yep. Ouchie. <laughs> Tacos. Lionfish, boo. Yep. Nurse shark. Juvenile grunts. Oh, right. What about right here? And what about back there? Oh, so close. We had a barracuda. There were tom tates. And there was a hogfish in the back, too. Cool. Thanks, guys. I do want to make mention that coming up in May on the second Wednesday, I have my final webinar of the spring season. It's a webinar series that I collaborate with, with my colleagues from Miami-Dade County Eco Adventures. And the talk is going to be Wednesday, May 12th at 12 p.m. on the benefits of blue and green spaces. So you are, if you're interested in this, because I'm sure you guys probably have more webinars that you want to add onto your schedule. I'll have Melissa put my I have Melissa put my email address back in the chat. So as per my usual, I wanted to try and find a new joke this year and I want to ask you guys, why didn't the fish pass their final exams? Any guesses? Ooh, they were floundering. Oh, they didn't go to school. Oh my God, I like those answers so much better. Where is it? It's because they work below sea level. Ha ha ha, it's a good one. I like these, these skip school. These are all, you guys are way more creative. So I am going uh, to you try see, and- uh, Somebody was asking how to dive with your group. Oh, well, I don't, so hi, hopefully you guys can see me now. I Now that I'm distraction free, I could put the, the camera on. I don't have a regular group that I go with. The, the two folks that you saw, the human fish you saw in that video, 
were my 67 year old dive buddy and his wife. So when we dive, I'm usually going off of his boat, but anytime if anyone, I'll use any excuse to get in the water. So if people wanna go and practice fish ID, we can figure out a way to make that happen. But most of my diving is done in Miami-Dade County and Monroe. So yeah, we have, it's seven o'clock. I made it, we didn't rush this time. And I think we got through everything. So I wanna, I wanna thank you guys for hanging in there. And, you know, I look forward to working with you and I wanna thank DEP's Coral Program for having me again. So if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box and we can, we can chat away. I'm gonna write down those jokes, the answers to the jokes too. Oh, the reef guide. The reef guide, Stephanie. Let me move this over here. Melissa, can you please put my email back into the chat so that way people can copy it and paste it? The, the books that I was suggesting are the human, so human but with two Ns, and Deloach. And it's the reef series. And if you just Google them, they'll pop up on Amazon and wherever else. So those are pretty, you will find them on every boat who has, even if there's not specific surveys going on, there's just always one of each of the creature, fish, and coral on every, on every boat. They're a fantastic guide. All right, so we've got Stephanie. Broward, oh yeah, we can go, I go to Broward too. We talked about that, Pamela. Lauderdale by the Sea, if, if anyone is familiar with Northern Broward County, Lauderdale by the Sea is a great beach accessible dive site. So if you're not familiar with beach diving, it is a little bit more intense just from the fact that you are parking and gearing up with all of your stuff and walking down the sand into the water. But the great part about it is you're not necessarily limited or restrained to the schedule of a boat. So you can go pretty much at any time. And you know, at the most, it's maybe 15 or 17 feet deep. So you can have a lot, nice long dive there and there's a lot to see. So definitely Lauderdale by the Sea is, is a great place to go. Coddle peduncle, yay, Stephanie. Oh, that's right, there is a beach cam. Pamela, if you put that, maybe if you put that in, I can, oh, I don't know what just happened. Hopefully you guys can still see me. There's a beach watch, cam for Lauderdale by the Sea. Watch the beach cam and look for a west wind. Mm -hmm. And I put your um, email, I answered a question with your email. I had it in the chat as well, but I'm not sure everyone sees that. So it's in one of the question answers. Okay, I see it. Yeah, it is in the chat. Beach cam, cool. All right, well, I think, oh, there it is. Okay, let me see if I can. Thanks, Pamela. I'm gonna copy and paste the beach cam and put it in the chat so it should be visible now to everyone in the chat menu. That and weather underground to check the winds for sure. Cause even though it's beach diving, you don't wanna be trying to fight the surge and the waves crashing on the shore. Plus that usually comes with visibility. That's not so wonderful, but yeah, that's a great location. Okay, there's a great group of folks who are there all the time. Awesome. Yeah, Gold Coast Scuba is nearby and you can you can rent tanks and gear from them. And I think there are still, Melissa, I don't know if you have the flyer in front of you, but there are still some classes left for DEP's Coral Programs Earth Month series. I, I think there are at least yeah, I think there are still a few more left, so maybe we can mention those so you guys have all the opportunities. Pulling it up now. Awesome. All right. 
So the next one is Tuesday, April 20th. That's a bleach watch training. Okay. And then Thursday, April 22nd is protecting Florida's coral reef, um, where you'll learn about the Coral Reef Protection Act and the Southeast Florida Action Network. April 27th is Coral Reef Story Time. And April 29th is Florida Stony Coral Identification. That's right. Awesome. Cool. Well, I think if there are no other questions, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. And just remember that if you register for this, you will receive a link to the recording once it has been posted or uploaded, however it's managed with the, the WebEx platform. So, or excuse me, go to webinar. So thank you guys all again. Yeah, it's getting time. It's dive time. It's getting warmer. Thanks, everybody. Mm-hmm.